Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt. And I'm Tim. We like to explore why we do what we do with researchers, thought leaders, practitioners, and even an accidental behavioral scientist every now and then. So welcome to all of you. Today, we are bringing you our episode with author and practitioner Tim Ash. But, but before we do that, we have some exciting news. Yes, we do. So if you're listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know that Kurt and I do this as a labor of love. Each episode takes a minimum of 10 hours to produce. And that's if everything goes well, which isn't always the case. <laughs> Particularly when I'm on board, right? That's that's for sure. It, it never goes as, as well as we'd like it to do. Um, but we do those hours without pay. And we do it because we love the conversations we have. We love the insights that we gain. And we love the feedback that we get from you, our listeners. But it's a lot of work. So we are excited that we have signed our first major sponsor. We're going to hold off on the details of who that is for now as we craft some creative launch around that. But keep tuned because we'll tell you more about this in some of the upcoming episodes. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? It is. It is. Okay, on with the show. We are excited to be able to get to talk to Tim Ash. Tim, besides having a great first name. Of course you would say that. Well, of I, course. Of course. A, it is a fantastic first name. He is an acknowledged authority on evolutionary psychology and digital marketing. He's a sought-after international keynote speaker and the best-selling author of Unleash Your Primal Brain and Landing Page Optimization, by the way, which is over 50 thousand copies sold worldwide and is translated into six languages. Tim Ash, not our Tim Houlihan, um, has been mentioned by Forbes as a top 10 online marketing expert and by Entrepreneur Magazine as an online marketing influencer to watch. He has also published over 100 articles, hosted over 130 podcast episodes, started multiple companies, and worked in many conferences that he has founded or started or worked with. There is a lot more in his resume that we just don't have time to talk about. But needless to say, he has uh, excelled at a number of things. And we are very, very honored to have him on the show. Absolutely. We talked to him about his insights from his new book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, exploring how evolutionary psychology can help us understand and respond to today's challenges. Yeah. So with that, we invite you to sit back in your rock Ing chair. Did you get that rock <laughs> a primal old oh, evolutionary? Your rock chair. Get that rocking that, that chair. Took me a minute. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think it'll take our listeners even more than a minute because it's really bad. Um, sit back in your rock ing chair with a fine primal brew and listen to our conversation with Tim Ash. Tim Ash, welcome to Behavioral Groups. <laughs> Glad to be with you, Tim. It's fantastic. And we're going to get started with the speed round. Kurt, you want to get started? We are going to get started with the speed round. So real quickly, Tim, um, and I have the easy job today because I just have to say Tim, and you guys have to figure out which Tim I'm talking about. Ah, so there we go. Crash the Tim Lazy bones. Yeah, I know. So, so Tim, are you a morning person or an evening person? Oh, morning person. I never thought I'd say that, but as I've gotten older, yeah, I'm only good for a few hours in the early part of the day. <laughs> okay. Would you prefer to have dinner with your favorite sports star, musician, or corporate leader? Yeah. Corporate leader sounds boring. Uh, I'm not a sports fan, so I'll take musician, Alex. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you just won the lotto with Tim. So, you know, he, my, my he's a musician. Yeah. yeah, there you go. All right. So would you prefer to learn a new instrument or a new language? I think that another language. I speak uh, Russian natively, English. Uh, uh, I took a dead language for three years, Latin in high school. And oh, wow. uh, after a semester of French, my teacher retired in junior high. And the only part I can remember is the phrase she said to me hundreds of times, which is, ferme la bouche. Oh, and which means? Shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't happened. Oh man, I had I had half a year of French in junior high as well, and that was the only language I got. I got through high school and multiple years of college without taking any other language. So 
I am a horrible American and I can only speak. Uh, <laughs> and, well, you mean you're American. typical, American. You're typical American. American. living in San Diego. I also picked up uh, quite a bit of Spanish from my salsa dancing days. So I can get my teeth kicked in uh, by saying a few phrases in Spanish. <laughs> Always good to have the swear words. That's right. That, that that's a plus. And you know, then, I, I, I will I will say I can I can ask for a beer in multitude of different languages. So. <laughs> Una más cerveza, por favor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Latin? Did you end up? Was it a Catholic high school? I just have to. No, add. no, it was a public high school. Fantastic oh. high school, Cherry Hill East in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And um, it was Latin has actually served me well. The etymology of so many languages traces back to Latin. So I can get by uh, anywhere from Brazil to um, Spain to Romania. It, it comes in handy a lot of places, it turns out. Fantastic. I love that. Okay. Last speed round question. Is it, and this, we're going back a little ways here, but is it better for a pet food site to use a dog bone shape and the title word French on their search button, fetch. I said French because now I'm primed. <laughs> to use the word fetch for their search button, or should they stick with a more conventional word like search with just a kind of a conventional shape as well? <laughs> oh, you bastards. You did your research. So you're going back to my landing page optimization book from 2008. Old stuff. Old stuff. Uh, yeah. No, uh, it's, it's better to go with convention because a convention is – um, something that a group of people agrees on. So pissing against the wind and doing unconventional stuff, unless it's 10 X better, don't even try it. Yeah. Which, which I think there's some relationship to your new book, right? So primal brain is, is, you know, your new book is coming out and it looks at how the brains evolved and what that means for us. So, and, and I, taking this one part that I just want to quote from it because I, I love this part, right? It says, uh, once you understand brain evolution, many of our behaviors will become more predictable. So given that, what, what do you want people to get out of this book? What, what Tell us the... Well, to, well, to me, um, I feel like uh, that fable of the blind men touching different parts of the elephant. One says it's a tree, it's a snake, it's a wall, uh, you know, all of these things. And to me, the red thread through the whole thing is our evolution. The brain just didn't pop into existence. It evolved. And we inherited things from the earliest forms of life on Earth to our own kind of end state, uniquely human, bizarre evolution. <laughs> so we need to understand where all of that stuff came from in order to understand behavior. And it really bothers me, guys. I'm sure you've seen this before. Everyone talks about our unconscious biases and it's almost like they're glitches in the matrix and it's something wrong that we need to cover up. And I I'm here to just say, hey, it evolved for a reason. It's better to understand it than to keep you know, spreading that lie of rationality that anything subconscious or suboptimal is wrong somehow. It was all based on evolutionary pressures. Yeah. So, so, so how, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. How <laughs> you got to be careful about which Tim you say, right? Cause now I you're was going to say, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> and then, uh, so it's interesting. The title of the book is unleash your primal brain, but boy, there is a lot of heart in your book, right? How, mm. how does this dichotomy exist for you? I, it's not a dichotomy. I think we're we're human beings with lots of dimensions, uh, emotional, spiritual, physical. And to, in fact, the brain is just an organ. I mean, I don't know what your beliefs are about uh, consciousness, and, but you know, we're part of a larger energy matrix and um, you bring your whole being to everything you do, or I think you should, otherwise you're wasting your life. You talk about uh, humans have made this evolutionary bet right? They made this evolutionary bet on culture spread. So can you expand on that and, and talk about what you mean by that? Yeah. So if you think of, uh, besides the very earliest forms of life on earth, there are independent animals and then there's kind of communal animals, right? A crocodile doesn't invest much in its eggs and hope some of them will be baby crocodiles one day. Uh, whereas mammals, you know, we're weaker individually, but we have the protection of the herd that introduces its own problems about how to act within the group and dominance hierarchies and so on. But human beings have this additional layer on top of the mammal layer, which is we didn't adapt for our environments. We spread all over the planet like a plague of locusts, right? But we physically haven't adapted. I mean, in minor ways, uh, but essentially we decided that we can learn more about our immediate environment and help us to survive than we could ever pick up in a lifetime 
by ourselves. So we're basically placing this big bet on learning the culture of our immediate surrounding tribe. And a lot of bizarrely human things have come out as a result of that. We have uninsulated brains. They're the most plastic of any animals. They, we can learn more. We're not pre-wired. Like a, a giraffe drops down to the ground and can stand up within an hour and follow behind its mom within a day. I mean, try that with a human. It's like, ah, <laughs> God, <laughs> no way. Baby that can't even walk for a year, right? So we're placing this bet on wiring everything up late. Uh, our brain development isn't majorly done till 25 or so and completely done till our mid 40s. That's, that's late. <laughs> um, we also delay our body growth that ad adolescent growth spurt when we become physically and sexually mature. That's so we can keep wiring up the brain at the expense of our body. We also have, um, well, think about all of us. I mean, we're men of a certain age. Um, once you get past your reproductive years, you're useless. And in human <laughs> beings, we live decades beyond our reproductive years. We're the only mammal that does that. Think about how strange that is. And all of that is to spread culture. All of that is to enable the spread of culture. So how does the culture then, obviously culture is a key piece of our evolutionary success, right? As you said, mm -hmm. we've spread throughout the entire world, all continents, and as you said, we, we didn't mutate like, uh, you know, other animals have mutated to adapt to the different things from a physical perspective, but it's this, this cultural piece that, that's doing it. So how does that actually help us in those situations um, today, right, where we are in a, a world that is interconnected or is it an impediment to our, our world today? Uh, because we are so interconnected. How, how do you see that happening? Well, I, I think that um, I really try to be value neutral. And what I mean by that is this is evolution. I don't care what cultural overlays you put on it and how you evaluate it as helpful or unhelpful. I mean, yes, it's true. We evolved for one environment, which is East Africa 200,000 years ago. Uh, and we're operating in bizarrely complicated societies of billions of people. So that's certainly not what we were designed for. But what's gotten us here is the same evolutionary pieces. And, and that's my point. So culture isn't good or bad. Uh, the best way to think about it is, again, there's a mammals put a premium on the survival of the tribe versus the individual. And we also do that to a heightened degree. So the best way to look at human evolution is it's the clash of cultural tribes. It's all about conflict between tribes and the tribes with the most coherency, with the most stability, with the most, um, how would you say, intensity win, whether it's a religious tribe, a, a, war, a war tribe, um, or just an idea tribe. Um, you know, Dawkins in his book about the selfish gene in the 70s talked about the spread of memes. They're its own kind of reproductive entity. And I don't mean the little pictures on the internet. I mean, the world is flat is a meme. Yeah. Vaccines don't work is a meme. Capitalism is good is a meme. All of these memes have adherence and their survival of these ideas depends on how well we transmit them and uh, without altering them and how quickly we transmit them. So we're designed for culture spread and for spreading whatever ideas are in our tribe. So how does this, this uh, help me reconcile the culture clash of tribes exist in large part because they're helping themselves. And so cooperation is a central part of the human condition. And yet we also have this, this competitive side. Mm -hmm. So in, in the value neutral way of looking at this, Tim, how do we, how do we reconcile this idea, idea that we, in some ways we need to be competitive. We survive because we're competitive, but we also survive because we're collaborative. Well, we're collaborative within our tribe. We're competitive against other tribes. It's, it's basically that simple. Now, the one thing that makes us uh, unique as human beings is we don't belong to a physical, tangible tribe only. In other words, we evolve for being in that close group, you know, Robin Dunbar style of 100 to mm -hmm. 200 people. Um, and those are probably our immediate or extended family. 
So genetically, we were related to him. It made sense, a lot of sense for us to propagate that tribe and for it to be successful. But now uh, you can think of us as being part of conceptual tribes, depending on what situation we're in. You know, I could, um, you know, like Kurt, I'm in the bald headed guy tribe. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm also a member of the Android phone tribe. <laughs> I'm also a member of the Mercedes driving tribe. Um, I'm also a member of the Russian immigrant tribe in America. Now, some of those yeah. are voluntary. Some are things we don't choose, like our, where we're born or our, or our ethnic background. Uh, but depending on the circumstances, we're in a different tribal allegiance is activated and we have overlapping ones. Yeah. Robert Sapolsky uh, talks about in, in his book, Behave, talks about how genes, you know, we, we have genes, but they're not and, and our neurochemicals that we have in our brain, you know, everything from uh, testosterone to dopamine, various different pieces. And he brings up a really interesting com component of this. And I want to get your take on this, Tim, is he talks about, you know, we, we can have these genes, but genes get expressed. And it's partly, I think, what you were talking about. We have this long development component. And so you, you're born with these genes, but they are expressed differently based upon uh, the environment and the learning uh, pieces that you're you're taught. And so, uh, again, thinking through testosterone, you know, we, we always believe, oh, that just makes us angry and, and physical. Well, no, it, it does in certain situations, but in others, it does not. So it's how it gets expressed is how then it, it, it takes to us here. So I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying is something similar, is that we are evolved from this uh, element and that our brains have evolved in such a way but that they're programmed, that they're, they're hard, hardwired for certain things, but there's that programming that comes in from this culture and we can get it programmed in multitude of different ways. And that is really what is going to be important for us moving forward. Is that? Yeah. Well, yes. And so that um, things I talk about in the book are the things that all 8 billion of us share. The basics are the same. The fact that we spread culture. Mm -hmm. So here, here's the fundamentals of culture spread. We are incredible mimics. Since our bodies are useless, we have mirror neurons, many more than other animals that observe the environment around us. So we're actually learning by not doing, we're just learning by watching what's going on around us. Uh, we know who to learn from. We have a lot of cues directly and indirectly about who to learn from. And there's another backward component to that is that people actually have developed this idea of, I guess, mentoring or prestige from teaching others. So the chain breaks if you don't transmit culture. So not only do we have to be rapacious learners, we also have to be fantastic teachers or the whole thing breaks down. And so in the, the payoff, the psychic payoff, emotional payoff we get from being mentors is actually even more powerful than being dominant at a mammalian level within a group. Uh, and it requires cooperation. You can't piss off the people that want to learn from you. Um, so. <laughs> which must have been tough for aristotle because he has a damn difficult question sir. <laughs> so there is a huge component of this uh pay it forward uh, that operates within humans and again that goes Kurt, i think to your earlier question about cooperation yeah we're super cooperative and uh we actually want to transmit culture because it's such a huge evolutionary edge this this idea of um uh, sticking with the way that we uh, evolved, we've got all these things going on. We've got we've got the conscious, we've got the unconscious playing at the same time, right? We've got both involved. Do you think that there are more predominant drivers of the of the things that have led us to to uh, to to where we're at today, to what our DNA is like, to what our 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 Bias, what we call biases and heuristics today. Um, do you think that there was a, a greater emphasis uh, or, or, or fuel from the unconscious versus the, the, the conscious in, in the development of yeah, these? Yeah, I don't, I don't even see that as a conflict. I mean, my, most of what we do every day is unconscious. Um, in fact, you've seen this on brain scans. Uh, you ask someone to do something, you see the brain activated, and then you ask them to describe it or act on it. That happens seconds later. So the conscious mind is really, I think Robert Heinlein, a science fiction author, said, man is not a rational animal. He's a rationalizing animal. I mean, we can come up with after the fact explanations but they, uh, for something, but they have nothing to do with the way the decision actually got made. In fact, uh, and this is uh, Robert Sachs did some work on this. There is no such thing as a rational decision. There is no Mr. Spock. Being Mr. Spock doesn't help you. 
all the conscious mind can do is give us options. And there are infinitely many of them in every moment. And the thing that narrows them down to something immediately actionable is our emotions. It's aversions and affinities. Yeah. Run away from it, do more of it. That's it. It's that simple. And the strongest ones are the ones we act on. There is So to say that our highest achievement is to be some kind of rational being and to tame these animal emotions is basically a non-starter. Yeah, it's interesting. Antonio Damasio talks about uh, that in in Descartes' air, where he's he brings up the the case study of of some of those people who have had brain lesions on parts that are the emotional mm-hmm. aspect of their brains, and and they are literally just stuck, right? They they yeah. they cannot they make a decide. decision, yeah. can't make a decision on what what to wear, on uh, on what restaurant to eat at, or anything. And so the the world of this mix between the emotion. And the the rational, I think, is is a hundred percent. They are intertwined. They are. There's not one way that we look at things through just a rational lens, nor do we look at things through just an emotional lens. There's there's that combination. Um, so with that, uh, going back to some of the the elements of this tribal component that we talked about, right? It served us well evolutionary to to be affiliated and and have affinity towards people who looked like us sounded like us um different pieces because that was that as you said that tribal component that we would protect ourselves and and other and propagate our genes yeah. propagate our genes right in today's world global cross-cultural world that doesn't necessarily serve us as well. So you had mentioned uh, a component earlier about, you know, having these other types of affinities, other, you know, somewhere your, your Android versus me being a, a iPhone, you know, kind of guy. Do we need to overcome that initial tribal thing in order to, to say, hey, no, I, I'm, a, I'm actually part of the iPhone tribe. Um, even though everybody that is part of this looks very different and sounds different and maybe even have some different beliefs, but I, I, I can form that tribe. Do we have to overcome aspects of that instinctual aspect that kind of give us, you know, I, I like people that look like me, sound like me. So what's your thought? Yeah, so, well, again, if we talk about cultural learning, there are universals there as well. We learn from co-ethnics, people okay. that look like us. We learn from people that will babble in our native tongue, even without uh, making any meaning of the words. We prefer the sound of our own language. We prefer uh, learning from people that are the same gender as us. So these are universals at every life stage and so on. So, and they're designed to keep genetic tribes together. If you speak the same language, look like me and are the same gender as me, you're probably a good role model for me because you can teach me about my immediate environment. Mm-hmm. And you're also more likely to be genetically related to me. So there is there is a, a strong tribalism and there's no way to avoid it. So I, I'm actually not an optimist in the sense that a lot of people say, well, we weren't designed for the, this complex environment, but what can we do to counteract it? The answer is not much. These are really, really strong rip currents pulling us away from the shore of, of a utopian society. But are we, in some ways, our DNA developed because we did a whole bunch of behaviors over and over and over again, over millennia, aren't we at least in the possibility of reshaping our DNA or not even reshaping, but we are constantly in an evolutionary process, aren't we? Yes and no. So it's actually true that at a genetic level, we, evolution is accelerating over the last 50 years. Um, and things like lactose intolerance and alcohol tolerance and blue eyes, they're popping out and are, are kind of like co-evolving. The culture and our technical advances are co-evolving us genetically to, uh, faster and faster. But over the course of our lifetime, no, you're still a fly stuck in amber. Oh, and one of two things is going to happen, I'm afraid. You know, we, we drive off of the climate extinction cliff or, um, you know, we start genetically engineering ourselves and the AI takes over. But, you know, we have a generation left here and nothing's changing on that time scale. Yeah, yeah you have definitely lost, lost some of your optimism. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what can I say? I, I want to leave a better world for my children. I'm afraid I'm not doing it. Well, so with that, you know, is there anything that we can do? I mean, and, and we know, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, um, is that, you know, knowledge in and of itself doesn't necessarily change behavior, 
right? You, you need to have other factors that get involved, whether those be environmental or incentives or other factors. So, but is there, are, are there any things that we can do to maybe overcome some of that al- aspect that makes you such a pessimist on this? Well, I, I'm a pessimist on um, this complex civilization, you know, that's speeding up and out of control being a sustainable thing. Um, um, perhaps some form of human life will survive. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I don't mean to make it sound like Book of Eli. Uh, I'm not talking about Mad Max here or something. Uh, but but um, I think that there are ways that we could live richer lives by actually doubling down on our primal natures. Um, and oh, there's a lot of okay. things we can do to lead more meaningful lives, I believe. Well, help us understand that. Yeah. Well, um, instead of saying, let's be... Uh, more efficient or more rational. One of the keys is to be more social. Uh, there's a famous longitudinal study at Harvard. It's been running, I believe, 70 years or so. It was, it was a Harvard cohort of people and their poor cousins, you know, Southeast from South Boston, the poor kids in town. And they've tracked these people over the course of their whole lives and have figured out that one of the huge determiners of wellness and life quality is your degree of social connectedness. In fact, the absence of that is apparently, from a medical standpoint, about the equivalent of being a two pack a day smoker. Oh, oh wow. Ouch. Yeah, it's that severe. So the worst thing you can do is isolate people. Um, there was a, I grew up near Philadelphia. I went to high school in, in New Jersey, and there was the Eastern State Pen, the penitentiary, and they had this amazing design. There was a central hub with an all seeing guard that can look in any direction, and then these spokes that radiated out from the center point that were the cell blocks. And each prisoner was kept in isolation. They even ins- isolated the pipe so they couldn't bang on them and communicate with each other. You had your own little external courtyard, they let you out an hour a day with a wall around it so no one could see you. And the idea was that your basic nature was good, but if you know, you were corrupted by bad influences. So if we left you in there with a Bible 24 hours a day, you'd come back to your true better nature. And not surprisingly, what actually happened is people went fucking crazy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, okay, you yeah. can't isolate people. And you look at these, I don't know if you've seen these on TV, these supermax prisons where they're isolated 23 hours a day. The lights are always on. And it's just, we're going to look back on this time and say isolation is the cruelest thing you can do to a human being. Well, isolation is torture, right? I mean, that, that yeah. you, you get sent to, to isolation when you've done something bad, when you're already in, in prison, right? This is This is not a good thing. And we know that from you know, just again, as you you mentioned, uh, you know, our tribal thing, the the worst pen- punishment was being banned from the tribe. You're yeah, out yeah, it's of this the tribe. escalating thing. I mean, we 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 have this, you know, again, as part of culture spreaders, we want to maintain the cohesion of our tribe, so everyone's in lockstep. And as soon as anyone's violating any norms, we have this escalating consequences for that. Uh, gossiping, uh, loss of mating opportunities, economic opportunities, uh, ostracism, like you say, banishment or even death. But basically all that's to keep us socially cohesive in our tribe. Yeah. You've also talked about uh, really keystone things like getting a good night's sleep and mm-hmm. uh, and just being active, right? Uh, these the and these relate to your to your primal self, right? Absolutely, sleep is daily life support. There's no form of life that lives longer than a few days on Earth that doesn't have some form of sleep. And on humans, it's extra demanding. I mean, when we were in the trees in Africa. That's all good. Our great ape cousins sleep an average of 10 to 15 hours a day. When we came out of the trees, now all of a sudden it's a lot more dangerous on the ground and our sleep was compressed to about eight hours. So that we have more complex social stuff going on, more repair work that needs to be done every night. And we're trying to compress it into a shorter time frame. And so uh, REM sleep especially is really important. So we sleep in about 90 minute cycles over the course of the night. And the difference between six and eight hours of sleep, that last 90-minute chunk, that's about half of your REM sleep. It's tail weight in the night. And without that, you're paranoid. You can't make good decisions. Basically, tribes and civilizations break down. Um, so you, you re- if you're sleeping six hours a day, you're really screwing yourself. Yeah, it, it, I, I have sleep issues that we've talked about, you know, a couple of times. And, and I, I am fully in agreement with that. You can – 
you can tell the difference and and it's not just one night it's multiple nights and the the difference is profound when you get a good night's sleep the difference that that makes is is big and the thing is is if you're if you're not focused in on it you you feel like you're doing okay right you you feel yeah. like i'm i'm doing everything just right but in reality your your performance as well as just your well-being as you said you can be my my kids know. They they yeah. they'll ask me. You know, did you get a good night's sleep last night? And I go, and why, why do you ask? Because you're grumpy. You know, <laughs> well, it's, like, well, it's not just grumpy. It affects a lot of things. For example, learning. Mm -hmm. uh, if, 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 if I used to cram and study and stay up for exams in college, and that's the stupidest thing you can do. Sleeping actually consolidates learning. It bumps out the old info there and puts it in long-term memory and creates new space for new learning to happen the following day. Without that, it's just you just don't learn. And that includes physical skills. You can practice those basketball free throws all day long, but if you don't sleep on it the night after, you don't consolidate the physical skill either. Yeah. Same is true of creativity. A lot of that happens as your brain rewires and makes non-obvious associations at night. So you're actually more creative after a good night's sleep. Yeah. So uh, thinking about uh, this book was a cr tremendously creative process because you're drawing on tremendous amount of resources, boiling things down. I can just imagine the mental hopper that you use to get all <laughs> these ideas down to, 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 into the book. Uh how, you know, tell us a little bit about the process that you use. How did you write the book? Well, and what got you going on it? What, what was the, well, okay, what was well, the catalyst? Guess, let's start at the beginning and then remind me to tell you about the process. So the reason I wrote it, um, as you may know for, uh, uh, well, as you may not know, as your, your listeners probably don't know, I, I studied at University of California, San Diego, undergrad and graduate school. Kurt, I didn't get my PhD. I was an ABD, all but no, this um, you, got oh. all the cool, you got all the good stuff. Yeah, yeah seven years all the learning. And didn't get the sheepskin. Oh, well. Um, but we, my, my study was in cognitive science and uh, computer engineering, double major. And then I stayed there for essentially AI, machine learning, neural networks. So I've always been interested in cognition. And UC San Diego was a fantastic interdisciplinary university. University. So I had a linguist, economist, electrical engineering guy, my PhD committee, a lot of really rich synergies. So I've always been interested in the brain, how it works, learning. And then I applied that to marketing. I ran for about 20 years, a marketing agency, which helped create more effective websites. The discipline is known as conversion rate optimization or CRO. Um, and we created 1.2 billion in value for clients like Nestle, Google, Facebook, Expedia, and so on. Um, and what I found is that you can't fake conversion rate optimization. It's that zero moment of truth when someone shows up on a website, do they act or don't they? And so we found the stuff that worked and a lot of it was based on these durable, I guess you'd call them neuromarketing principles. And I wanted to understand why those work. But most of our clients used it for good, I guess you'd say, some not so much. And so what became apparent to me is that these huge companies with their statistical models and data scientists and um, were really kind of uh, had the power. And this is true of big governments too. And this could be used to strip us of our money, to divide us politically, uh, to spread falsehoods. And most of us are operating with the wrong model of what our brains are like. So my goal is to really just demystify all of that and say, this is how your brain really works, how it came to be. Say that in a non-scientific way. You see in the book, there's no footnotes or endnotes or graphs or diagrams. It's perfectly readable. And it's also an ebook and audio book. So I designed it for that and for easy translation to other languages. But basically, I want to be like the Carl Sagan of, um, I guess you'd say, evolutionary psychology. He's the, <laughs> I should say, for the younger listeners, Neil deGrasse Tyson 1.0, the original guy. <laughs> astrophysics to everyone. It was like billions and billions of stars. You know, you did that well. <laughs> exactly. You did that well. Astrophysics nice. fun. I can certainly do that with the brain. And so my real purpose is to say, hey, this is how it really works. Let's do some myth busting all of this stuff about the rational brain, let's put that aside and stop bringing the knife to the proverbial gunfight. So at least you can see how these larger corporations and, and algorithms are manipulating you and take yourself into better account. I'm just trying to level the playing field. So how is the process? So coming back to the process of writing, mm -hmm. the book, how, did, how did it come about? 
Well, I know some of your guests. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm a huge fan of some of your guests. In fact, Robert Cialdini, who was on your show, episode 50, I believe, uh, blurbed my yeah. book. I'm, I'm, he loved it. I'm really happy about that. So that was, he's one of my professional crushes. So I'm glad yeah. it's reciprocal. <laughs> um, what, but basically, I wanted to, I saw problems with understanding the brain at the level of detail and at the level of siloing. Uh, in other words, they're either researchers or slowly rolling back the foreskin of science and saying, I'm advancing it in this little narrow area, but they're horrible communicators. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't name names, but some of the you know, important books in the field are completely unreadable. And it was painful just to go through them. Um, at the other end of that spectrum is are the people that turn 50 blog posts into a book. They just summarizing other people's research and saying, here's a hundred behavioral economics tips and tricks that you can use to manipulate consumers. You know, it's yeah. why they work, no idea, but here, do this. Um, yeah. And so that was a problem. The other is the siloing. The neuroscientists aren't talking to the economists or the policymakers or the habit change people or the personal development and spirituality people. No one's talking to anybody. They're like the blind men touching the elephant and coming to different conclusions. And so to me, the red thread through all of this was behavioral economics, uh, sorry, uh, evolutionary psychology. <laughs> yeah. Again, the brain didn't just pop into existence. There's an arc that we have to retrace. And I do that in order from earliest life on earth to to culture, language, uh, that kind of stuff at the end. So my process was to read and digest all of these books. Uh, I recommended about 30, but I read about 40, and then papers and um, scientific journals. I put it all into raw form. I just extracted what supported kind of the evolutionary psychology narrative. And I had raw material, 300 pages of raw material to work with that I transcribed out of all of these books. And then I reorganized it into roughly a, uh, I guess you'd say a, a timeline that corresponded to evolution. And then I had to add a lot of my own connective tissue interpretation, filling in the blanks and making it really readable and accessible. So I was kind of crunching through raw material and making it into unique my own coherent, uh, accessible description of things. So then after lunch, you just sat down and wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> my God, this sounds like an immense process. It was a two-year process. It looks like every every one of my three books has taken two years to write. That's a, So whenever anyone says, you know, like, um, have a lot of kindness for authors because really to give birth to a book, I always joke it's the closest that a man will ever come to giving birth to uh, <laughs> a long, drawn out, painful <laughs> process, very bloody at the end. And then the real work begins, which is publicizing the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so Tim, in, in our exchanges in advance of, of actually getting to meet each other here, uh, you, first of all, you, you did your homework, you know, that we're going to talk about music uh -huh. and you, and you came back in an email and you said, I love talking about music. So I just have to just open that up for what what is it about the idea of talking about music that was attractive to you? I think um, I view at the highest level the universe as, as vibration, different fields, energy forces, resonances, collisions of, of waves, whatever you want to call it. Music is about the most primal expression of that there is. Um, and... I've tried to adapt, like I said, to be a better primal human, to do things at body scale. So I find that, you know, a lot of music is based on the tempo of our heartbeat. You know, DJs will amp it up to 120 BPM. That's if your heart's beating 120 beats per minute, you're excited. And that's yeah. so yeah. we're in a rave. That's what they have going. Um, but the minor major chords, um, it, it just... It, it all is a way of affecting our physical energy field. Do you play an instrument yourself? Or I don't. Um, I, I had a piano, recorder, guitar class in junior high. And my dad, well, well, we wait, had all three of those. My dad even got a little upright piano for the trimester I had that and played it twice. And then one day it wasn't there anymore. My brother is the musician in the family. He's super talented. He did violin, guitar, electric guitar, bass electric bass, upright bass. That's what he studied, um, both classical and uh, jazz at UC San Diego. Also went to the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. So he got the music gene. I'm the photographer, artist, poet, 
in the family, but I, I love music. Both very creative, both very creative. And again, I, I go back to the fact that you heart is all over the book, I, which I, which we're big fans of. Thank you. But, I, to me, that's a huge compliment uh, because it's, if it's just about downloading science in, a, in an accessible way, that's not enough. I want to leave a different mark on the world. Yeah. So uh, what's on your playlist these days? What What are the things that in the middle of a pandemic you're you're listening to? Well, I'll tell you, I wrote, you know, I, I'm actually in a way grateful for some many of the gifts of this of this time. And one of them was giving birth to the book last spring is when I wrote the bulk of it um, and finished it up. So uh, one of the things that I was on my soundtrack then was uh, Pat Metheny Group. Uh, it goes back to the seventies, uh, white album, huh? like the original Pamathini group white album. I, 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 I had them all as records. And, uh, then I last train home was on repeat. There's a YouTube one hour version of that, that someone put together. That was great. I, and also, um, I, I'd never run across before, uh, Chet Baker, uh, didn't have a happy life or put out happy music, but, oh my God, Miles Davis got nothing on that guy. Um, yeah, Chet Baker's yeah. trumpet playing is incredible. Um, yeah. So I can recommend one particular song. He covered an Elvis Costello song called Almost Blue. Oh, so wow. Find Chet Baker's version, the seven minute version of Almost Blue. It's, it's not even about the notes. It's about the emptiness between them. It's incredible. So Tim, it sounds like you were, lis- you listened to music then when you worked. It's, or do mm-hmm. you, is, is that part of it? So you do? Yeah, and it's it's important that it be nonverbal because again, the the conscious part of the mind, the one that processes language, is operating completely differently. So it just needs to be instrumental. And if I'm going to be using it uh, to kick in creative stuff or write, so you mentioned a couple of jazz artists. Is most of your listening while you work jazz? Um, because yeah, because the the nonverbal jazz. Yeah, I, I'd say that. My, my wife is a universalist. Um, she's very accepting and open, and that's, again, non-judgmental. Uh, but there's also an element of non-discrimination in that. So she likes everything from Jay-Z <laughs> to Rihanna. Um, I, uh, to me, it's a quality threshold. And it's easier wow. to find in classical music and in jazz. These people have what you'd call chops. You know, they They have some basis for doing what they're doing. To use a... Uh, a visual art analogy, you know, when Picasso did his scribbles at the end of his life and just a few gestural things, that wasn't just some epileptic seizure. I mean, you know, from his blue period that he could make anatomically correct human beings and he was intentional. And so to me, it's the same thing. If you want to be a dancer, classical ballet has got to be the foundation. Then you can do whatever you want with it. But if you're one of those flop around modern dancer types that, um, you know, how do I know if you even meant to do that? Yeah. So to me in music, there's certain genres that are inherently higher quality uh, because they require, uh, I'm a huge fan of Latin music. I'm a salsa dancer. Uh, so the sophistication of a salsa band, you know, there's nothing like it in Western music since the big band era, you know? So I gravitate towards things that require chops and quality. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever read Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance, but that, that concept Robert Persig has of a ret, the Greek word, which is excellence or quality. I look for that in everything in life. Yeah, that's a great book. We share more than just a, a name on that. I spent my first year in college at the Kansas City Conservatory of Music because I was because I thought if I was going to and I was hoping to be a music producer at the time. I was eighteen, but I thought if I'm going to produce, be a music producer, I really need to understand the literature. I need to get the, the deep background mm-hmm. on music literature and have my chops on performance before I actually go into the to the studio. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't last. <laughs> yeah, some, some of my favorite documentaries are actually like, how was this particular like record or recording made? That's that's some really cool stuff if you run across stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Those are the good old days. <laughs> when, <laughs> when we had albums with with you know with liner notes and things like that. Yeah, and people actually, had the attention yeah. span longer than that of a lit match. Yeah, now it's all just TikTok. Yeah, well it is. It's interesting to think about the how how that has changed over generations and and there was a a story that i was reading recently that was just talking about or heard a conversation excuse me uh, the the conversation was you know we are in an age where we can learn anything by 
simply Googling it and, and doing different things. So we are, we have this breadth of, of knowledge, right? That is wide, but it is really shallow. And, mm -hmm. and that the, this idea of people actually spending the time to dig in deep and get that, the build the chops, as you say, mm -hmm. is, is one that they're going, is this fading away? Is this moving out of, of what we are, are kind of how the the culture is 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 moving we're moving yeah. towards this like oh we you know we need to know everything and a little bit of it and then we become experts on social media and everything else and we can spew all right i well i read predictably irrational so i am a <laughs> behavioral economist i you know i i listen to behavioral groups podcasts so now i can go out there and and i i heard tim ash's thing so now i'm a uh you know a evolutionary uh psychology you know, psychologist yeah. and, yeah. and i can do yeah. that and I think there's something to that. I, I mean, I, I I hope it's not to to that degree, but I think there is this component where we are losing kind of this ability for us to focus. In terms of music, um, I remember again. I'm I'm a uh, at the front end of the Gen Xers. Um, just made the cutoff. And I definitely listen to albums and I didn't do it in a drug induced state, but listening to something like dark side of the moon as an album, as it was designed to be listened to, mm -hmm. right. Devoting that 45 minutes or whatever it is to the whole album was something because it took you on a journey and there's no way you can do that as a highlight reel. You need to experience the whole thing end to end. Or I'll use another analogy. Um, uh, and at UC San Diego, I was a saber fencer. I was a conference winning, all Cal winning saber fencer. And I really enjoyed the martial arts. And then later, many years later, I studied Tai Chi with a master from uh, originally from Hong Kong for five years. And you know, when you think about martial arts, it's definitely like a guru or disciple led tradition. In fact, in, you know, in Tai Chi, there's this, you become an indoor student. You have to show your devotion for three years and do all that wax on, wax off karate stuff, kid, before they even take you in and teach you the real stuff, right? And um, in fact, the very word Kung Fu in Chinese martial arts, it doesn't mean a fighting art. What it means is um, essentially an ability gained through diligent effort, similar to chops in music. So it's the drip, drip, drip into a bucket to fill it up. There's no shortcuts. And I think, yeah, we're just kind of skimming like a, like a stone uh, a cat, uh, thrown across the surface of a pond and never going deep. And that definitely takes away from the quality of life. Tim, final thoughts about, about tribalism and how we can bring our primals, how we can manifest our primal selves in the best way. Mm, I think a real key and it's not like you have to like people that I disagree with you is to stretch. I think what you find is um, the most parochial, closely held tribes are the most, uh, the strongest at withstanding the larger society, but they're also the most extreme. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, Without offending anyone, I'll use you know, communities or religious communities like Hasids, Hasidic Jews, for example, very close tribes. They don't associate with the rest of the world or people in the Balkans. I mean, there's constantly civil wars going on there because of the geography of the place. You don't go over the mountain to the next valley. You stay in your valley. And so their tribalism is super strong. And so I think an antidote for a lot of it is to stretch beyond our current tribes. It's to go and make the effort to contact other people that are very different from us. And the people who choose not to do that are going to be the ones that kind of bring down um, the larger society, I believe. So um, it's to travel, uh, to interact with people. Now, how do you do that without drinking the poison? <laughs> how do you do that without letting it affect you uh, in negative ways? Uh, I think the practical stuff comes out of things like um, uh, Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication protocols and things like that. And how to listen to people without taking their stuff on yourself um, and understand listening for their deeper needs and finding the commonalities you do have with them. I find myself going back to things like um, Don, Don Miguel Ruiz's The Four Agreements. You know, one of them is not making assumptions. So it was like, what did you mean by that? I took it to mean this. Is that what you meant? I mean, simple things like that, instead of reacting right away, 
um, asking lots of questions. So I think that diversity, I don't mean the politically correct sense of the word, but having stretching beyond your comfort zone in, in terms of your experiences and putting in, flexing those mental muscles there is really important. I love that in an hour we could talk about Don Miguel Ruiz. We could talk about the Four Agreements. We, we could we could talk about Carlos Castaneda. <laughs> we could, and then we'd also have Robert Heinlein and uh, Damasio and Dawkins and Neil deGrasse Tyson. This has just been a fantastic, absolutely fantastic conversation. We are so so grateful, Tim, for your time, your insights, and and the the joie de vivre that you you bring to to life and share it with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. This has been fantastic. As as Mr. Hulahan already said but man uh just amazing stuff so we appreciate it it's my honor gentlemen and if people want to find out more about my public speaking or internet consulting they can visit timash.com and if you're interested about the in the book that we've been discussing unleash your primal brain just go to primalbrain.com and all of the info will be there Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our conversation, have a free-flowing discussion, and talk about whatever else comes into our primal brains. This was the easiest, the the most Good call. easy one to, to use for what kind of brain we have. <laughs> I mean, it's in the title of his damn book, Primal, <laughs> primal Brain. And, and it was a really wonderful book. I really enjoyed it, and I want to recommend people get it because he does. He is a master at evolutionary psychology. He's really a very smart guy, and he does a wonderful job because he lives in the practitioner world of integrating that into in, into neuromarketing. I think he's he's a he's got a lot to offer in that book. I, I, it's it's fascinating because if you look at his background on you know neuro marketing and, and other pieces of it, you kind of go evolutionary psychologist. It doesn't really match, but he does. He brings in some yeah. wonderful insights. And I love the idea that he's translating a lot of the research terminology and insights into a lay person's understanding. And so I think that makes this book really accessible and the insights that he has really uh, able to be applied in a lot of different areas of our lives to help us. So of course that would appeal to us because we're practitioners. <laughs> I thought it was just because we, we don't understand the research stuff. Is that <laughs> you're like, Oh no, that's way, way over our heads. Let's dumb it down to our level. There you go. Uh, true. True. That too. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, oh, so I love, I love, I love my evolutionary psychology. So, um, yeah. yeah. You know, so where do you want to start with, with our, where they're grooving on uh, Tim Ash? biases and heuristics are not glitches or irrational. Yeah. He, and, and, and I'm going to quote him here. He said, he says, everyone talks about our unconscious bias and it's almost like they're glitches in the matrix and it's something wrong that we need to cover up. And I, I just think that, you know, he goes on to say that, no, this is, it's evolved for a reason. It's better to understand it. And, and as opposed to just saying this is irrational, it's like understand why we have these biases, why we have these heuristics, why they're not glitches in the matrix, but they're yeah. actually there for a reason. And if we can understand that reason, then maybe we can use those biases and heuristics and glitches to our benefit. That's a huge misconception. Huge, yeah. right? Th that we have have gone down this path to to easily define our world and our our decisions as either rational or irrational. And it's just not that simple, right? It, it's just not, right? Because when, when we look at it from an evolutionary perspective, we are wired this way for, for very good reasons. Our, yeah. the, the world today is much more complex and much different than our evolution was preparing us for, basically. Well, and we need to understand that so that we can apply the way that we are wired to this modern world and to take advantage of those so that we're not fighting against it saying, oh, that's irrational thoughts or various different pieces. Instead, we're saying, let's use this. Let's use this bias that we have in order to 
achieve the goals that we have and to fit in with the modern world and how we're, we're operating within it. So, Right. And and that could, could lead us to this idea about the importance of culture today, <sighs> right? Be- because it's not so much that culture is a good thing or a bad thing. It just is. It's not so much indigenous versus Western that it, it's not, you know, a, a this or that. It can be all of it. You know, I, I was recently reading some uh, Asian his, some history of uh, Asian uh, philosophies and saw that the Upanishads were written, which which are Indian scriptures, basically, were written okay. 600 years before Christ. And so these, much like a, a lot of uh, the Bible, there's a lot of things that have been written a long time ago that speak to the human, the central aspects of the human condition. And we are still returning to those basic ideas today thousands of years after they've been written, but our cultures are different, right? The application of them has to be different because the world that we live in, it's not to take anything away from the universals that we discovered, but the application of them is going to have to be more contextually based. Well, and this idea that we took a bet as a human species on culture and that we haven't evolved to fit into the different, you know, environments that we are, and we've overtaken the entire world globe, right? We are on every corner of the globe. We live there and our basic anatomy hasn't changed, but right. our culture has changed. And and so we now are able to do that because of that cultural impact that, that we've had. And I think that's really important. But the other piece that he brings in is that culture evolved to have groups of, you know, a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand. Right. And we are now in a world, an interconnected world of billions, seven plus billion people. And so the way that we evolved our culture was a tribal and it was us versus them. And that doesn't always work anymore. But he brought in this, this idea of these, um, that we're part of multiple tribes that, and that we are part of these conceptual tribes. And I yeah. thought that was fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, he, he brought up that, you know, me and him share this bald headed man tribe, right? <laughs> right. Which I'm a proud member. I'm a proud member of the bald headed man tribe. Way to go. But, but there are other ways of looking at these, these different tribes that we can be part of that have their own little culture. Obviously there's the religious, there's politics, there are um, some other things, but you can, he brought up this, you know, the product that I'm an Apple, I'm the Apple tribe, or I'm the Android tribe, or I am an IBM or, or a Google or whatever it would be. Or, you know, that there's musical tribes, that there's the jazz aficionado tribe. There's the, you know, industrial rock tribe. Yeah. Go industrial rock. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> But I think those are really key pieces to this, which which lends it to this idea that, all right, one of the concepts that Tim brought up was this idea that we we fight against the other tribes, that for our survival is based on our tribe surviving and the other tribe, you know, being defeated. And in this interconnected globe, that that doesn't really work. Because we, we, you know, this ethnic, while there are still ethnical, ethnical, is that not even a word, right? I don't ethnic think tribes. Yeah. yeah. There we go. <laughs> right. That you can base that I have this, you know, I'm a European descent or I'm an African descent or I am Asian descent, whatever it would be. And you can have those aspects of, of that tribe. But you know what? We're, we're fluid and that we are parts of these different types of tribes. And so maybe there's hope. Because as opposed to us, like it's us versus them, that the them is part of another cultural group. So I might be, you know, very different from another bald headed man, but because that's a bald headed man, he's part of my bald headed man tribe or my Timberwolves, you know, basketball team tribe or my religious tribe. And I have multitudes of these conceptual tribes. And so by looking at all the tribes that I'm a member of, that starts to include a lot more people. And so I cannot just dismiss them as being, oh, you're on the opposite political side from me. And so therefore you're evil and bad and I must defeat you. Well, but yeah, but you're also part of this Timberwolves tribe. Oh, you're also part of this rock and roll tribe. You're also part of this whatever tribe. And so I have to 
look at you and go, all right, maybe you're not part of another tribe. You're part of just a different tribe within that, that I'm a part of. At the same time, we need to think about our be willing to accept the fact that our individual behavior is going to impact all of those tribes, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like Coleman's boat, right? Your individual behavior is going to influence the social norms of all of those groups, right? And, and of course, the social norms of all of those groups are also at the same time influencing you. Yeah. But you have the opportunity, we each have the opportunity to get a little bit outside of the very narrowly defined contextual and conceptual tribe that we're in and and expand our our vision just a little bit to say gosh the way i act is going to influence a lot of people in a lot of different tribes i could be a better person wow you said that in like two sentences what i took just like five minutes rambling to say awesome. is that what you were is that what you were trying to say <laughs> I, I don't know but you said it you said it fantastic and well he brought up this idea that you know we're collaborative within our tribe so if we can yeah. again expand who is in the different tribes that we have, we can be more collaborative, making a better world. So yeah, yeah, we we really this was this was something that we tried to talk about was co competition versus collaboration. But just just to hit on it one more time, or I shouldn't say hit on collaboration, <laughs> just <laughs> gently touch on the idea of collaboration one more time. It we so much more succeed when we collaborate than when we compete. Mm -hmm. There's lots of lots of evidence out there. Okay, um, how about if we talk about this this rationalizing versus irrational, sort of the rational versus irrational stuff? Right. So this idea that we are rationalizing creatures and not rational, and that this idea that we should become more rational, that this people, if we were only more rational, we would be better. And I thought it was an interesting twist where where Tim said. You know, that's not really the issue. The issue is that we should be more social because yeah. all of the research points to us being better when we are social and we have positive social relationships with others. And he pointed to the Harvard Longitudinal Study that looked at 80 plus years of research on, on this that showed, hey, people who had close relationships, more than money, more than fame, more than anything else, um, are, are what keep people happy throughout their lives. Yeah, and uh, I love the, the work that's been done by uh, Nick Epley and Juliana Schroeder on, uh, I think they asked people to get onto trains and talk to uh, one group to talk to people and another group don't talk to people. And they predicted that the people who didn't talk to each other would be happier than the people who were forced to talk to each other. And even those those individuals said, I'm not going to be happy talking to people on the train. Well, you had people who are introverts and, and that that's a, yeah. you know, not a good thing. Yet, Don't. what did the research say? What did the data imply? Ah, yes, let the data shine through and bring us the light. <laughs> yeah, so the data said that the people who talked to others on the train were happier in their commutes than those who didn't. And that goes to even those people who are extroverts, and you would think, yes, that would be the case, as well as the introverts who yes. you would assume, and they thought themselves that it wouldn't be bad. And and for many people, and there was, uh, what was, we, we saw another researcher, I can't remember the name now, but they looked at this idea that, hey, maybe part of the reason we don't converse is that we feel like we're imp imposing on the other person. And so they had this unique little thing where they put... Um, red bracelets on or green bracelets uh, over lunch or these these tokens in front of them green meant yeah I'd, i want to be talked to red means no leave me alone um and they they measured happiness and and again people with the green uh were much happier the people that were having conversations had were much happier than the people that were eating alone and, and in silence so and so in lieu of having bracelets that indicate when we want to talk to people and when we don't we might just have to be more intentional. And I've gotten to be more intentional about talking to uh, people at the grocery store, right? We've got, we're still in the middle of the pandemic and all of us are wearing masks. So the, the person who's checking out my groceries is wearing a mask and I'm wearing a mask. And sometimes it's hard to hear with the, all the background noise, but it's nice to just have a tiny little exchange. It could be about the weather or how, you know, I was, <laughs> just getting checked out and somebody said, wow, you got some really nice carrots here. Like, we, <laughs> like that was a really random comment and it just made me laugh. My, my, my wife and I just laughed and like, yeah, I guess 
we guess we did pick out some good carrots, but that mm-hmm. tiny little exchange, it, you know, it still is in my brain as a little source of happiness. You know, it brought joy. You know, your yeah. nice carrots brought joy to the world. <laughs> That's right. And it pulls us out of isolation. Yes. Right. And, and, uh, and what's the, what's the research uh, indicate that isolation is if you're isolated, it's almost like as if you're smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. That's what Tim was saying. Yeah. So I think there's some really interesting aspects of this that to be better people, to be happier people, let's be more social. Let's not worry about being more rational, although it's important to be rational, particularly in these days of conspiracy theories and different things. And you need oh, to look yeah. at the data and then we, can, yeah. we won't go down there. No. Be more social. And that's going to lead you to a better, happier, longer life. Yeah. So, Tim, there was there was one part of this conversation that I thought you were going to pounce on, which I thought <laughs> was really interesting because it was in the musical part, right? Yes. And, yes. and, and he was talking about um, – how he likes jazz and you kind of were, Whoa, wow. Wow. How is this? And he talked about chops, you know, having this, um, you know, these people have what you call chops, you know, they have some basis for doing what they're doing. And then he brought in this Picasso analogy that, you know, Picasso could just scribble at the end of his life, but you knew that he had the chops. You could see that through all of the work that he had and these people that have put this time in. So what do you think about this idea of having, chops and how that in parts in music, but also just then in, in life. Is there, is there something there? I think there is the first there's, and there's two thoughts that come to my mind on this. The first is that having more chops, having more ability, having a greater uh, reservoir of, of capabilities Mm -hmm. allows you to be more, uh, uh, to riff, right, and to improvise more, and that can be really rewarding, and it feels it feels really good. So having this greater, it's like having a greater vocabulary helps you describe things more vividly. And oh, that's my problem. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> my my hundred word vocabulary very very small. I need a deeper vocabulary. Okay, well, cool. keep going. Jazz musicians talk about uh, having a jazz vocabulary. So, mm. like, there is this aspect of um, you can experience more joy in your improvisation in life by riffing on things if you have greater abilities. So, I, I agree with that. But the, there is a second thing, and that is, I think that any way, any place along the curve that you are, with whatever level and degree of capabilities that you have you can still find joy in riffing. Mm. I was asked to solo the very first time I played with another group of people. I was 13 years old and I had been practicing and I had a, you know, a pretty good command of what the fretboard looked like on my guitar. But somebody just turned to me and said, you're next. (gasps) (sighs) (laughs) Aside from sheer terror, it actually kind of said, well, I just have to go with what I know and work from there. And, kind of edged my toes out to the edge of the of the surfboard and tried to hang 10 basically so you were pushing the boundaries yes. regardless of of how deep that level of understanding or knowledge is so you were a picasso when he was just beginning and <laughs> trying to push the boundaries a little bit but did that from your what what i hear you saying is that by pushing it it brought you joy first yes, off. Yeah. It was scary, but once it was done in retrospect, right, the remembering self looks at this, but right. it also p- probably pushed you a little bit to a deeper understanding. So it helped you get past just this status quo and, and get into a, a deeper understanding of what you could do with the guitar and what you needed to learn and all of those aspects. Absolutely. Absolutely. The way that you said that was, again, a two sentence summary that was perfect of my 18 sentence <laughs> description. Thank you for that, Gert. <laughs> well, there you go. That's why we work well together. Reciprocity. Yeah. Reciprocity. Yeah. All right. So there, there, just a, one more thing from music that he mentioned. And I thought that, again, you would jump on this one is he said, quote, Music is about the most primal expression that there is. Yes. Agree, disagree, Tim. Oh, (laughs) well, the research is that music goes back about as far as written language, about 40,000 years. So 
our, our language, not, not um, excuse me, spoken language and music happened at roughly the same time, 40, 45,000 years ago. And that's pretty cool. That does say to me that the, um, the application of music in our lives is central to who we are. Mm. I think Joel Weinstein, uh, Weinberger talked about this, right? When we, when we were talking to him that the Odyssey was sung, the Iliad was sung originally, and mm. because it helped us remember things, but it's also a way of experiencing the world that is totally different. And I want to encourage every one of our listeners to listen to some music today, something that's meaningful to them and engages you. And I, I'm going to ask you, Kurt, engage in what music are you going to engage in today that will take your heart and connect to your your primal soul? Hmm. You know what I've been, you know, you know, grooving on is is the jingle from Toys R Us lately. <laughs> really? It's been it's an earworm in my head. I don't know why. I'm a Toys R Us kid. Lots of toys at Toys R Us that I can play. With. Anyway, um, I'm joking. I am joking. I, I it has been an earworm, but I, I've not but been that, grooving on it. I've been trying to get it out of my head. Um, uh, yeah. So replace yeah. it with something that's meaningful. What what could you replace it with today? What would be a go to song that would deeply connect you to that primal soul? You know, I think there's lots of different songs. I mean, I, I look at again for me right now. I've been listening to a lot of Sea Wolf and some of uh, his work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's some great iron and wine songs that kind of, again, I, I, the musical part for me is really important, but there's also the lyrical aspect and the, yeah. that component, which combined are what really make it impactful for me. So I look for those songs that have this musical part that pulls me in, uh, with an enjoyable rhythm tune melody, whatever that would be. I don't know the right terms because that's not me, but I love that when it's tied with this lyrics that evoke a certain emotion, a certain story narrative that goes on and then transports you into a different thing, which you can have with the story alone, but with the music, it just makes it different. Where Again, like Tim talked about, you know, the beats per minute and, and how many beats per minute are they going? And that changes how our heart rate happens and right. changes some of the, the physiological components that we have in our body. And I think the combination of both of those go there. So a lot of people don't recognize that. Uh, I think it, it's not rare, but there are just a lot of people in the world who are just thinking more in terms of the beat. And I think you've hit on something that's really important to use one of your favorite bands, Depeche Mode, in, in a song like People People Are People. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's really fantastic is if we just looked at the words, people are people, and why should it be you and I should get along so awfully? That's a nice, that's a nice little couplet. It's mm-hmm. nice. But you combine it with the the melody and the music behind it, and now it gets to be an important anthem, mm. right? It goes from just being "those are nice words" to that has meaning, and yeah. that's what makes it. That's what makes music for me so powerful. Is that we're taking the, a, an important message and amplifying it with the music. You bring up an interesting piece that just hit my head, and probably wrong, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. This idea that it's this anthem, and so when you think about some of the protests and some of the marches doesn't matter which side you're on and they get these cheers going right these these chants they're musical to a certain degree yeah right? absolutely yep there's a there's a cadence to them there's this rhythm you know whatever it be you know no justice no peace you know whatever Very it would be yeah. it's you know or you know stop the steal whatever it would be but there is that aspect that musical component to it it doesn't have necessarily music underneath it but there's a musical element to it didn't really ever think about yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's rhythmic and oftentimes has rhyme and yeah. it makes it more memorable and it makes it more pleasing to listen to. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Music. Who would have ever thunk? There you go. <laughs> okay, hang on tight, folks, because we're going to come back in just a second. Kurt is going to wrap things up with a bonus track. This is Kurt with your bonus track and groove idea for the week. Our conversation with Tim Ash about his book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, explored a few key concepts. First, 
We are not rational beings, and that is okay. We didn't evolve to be purely rational, and we need to understand that and to use that to our advantage. Second, as a human species, we took a big bet on culture as an evolutionary differentiator, and it worked. But now, in our current age, with over 7 billion super inc interconnected people on Earth, we need to rethink who is in our tribe and build conceptual tribes that expand our tribal universe. Culture is important, and it is used to spread ideas, so just think about that and think about who is in your tribes. Third, to be happy and live longer, we need to be more social, not more rational. Research shows that it is important to have a strong, positive social relationships, and those are key to our longevity as well as to our happiness. Okay, it's time for the groove idea of the week. We want to build off the last idea that we were just talking about. Being more social is important. We are still living with a pandemic where social connections are hard, but this week, we want you to reach out to someone you haven't talked to in a while, a relative, an old high school buddy, an old business associate, and just have a conversation. Make that phone call, send that text, whatever it is, but rekindle that social connection with that person. Once you do that, let us know how it goes. And as always, if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a review or share it with a friend. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast to make sure that you don't miss any one of our episodes. And we look forward to talking with you next week. But this week, we want you to go out and find your groove.